Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Writer's Chat. And this is where we like to gather together as all as writers, talk about writing and learn about writing and grow as a community supporting one another as writers. So we welcome everybody here. We see a lot of our regular crew in the chat today. So we're excited <laughs> about that. And if you're taking the time to watch us on the replay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time for some self-care as a writer to learn something new and to grow and to continue to develop this craft because I think we're important to develop our gift from God as a, a craft that way. So anyway, I am excited. I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to introduce our special guest today. And we've got a topic that we all need to learn more about. And I'm sure we have some questions about too. So Melissa, would you want to introduce our special guest today? Sure. Thank you. And um, today I have the special privilege of introducing you to uh, G. Connor Salter. And he is going to talk to us about a very important topic today. But before I jump into that, I'll just give you a little intro into him. I read his bio for you. Uh, G. Connor Salter is an SEO editor with Salem Network, as well as a writer with over 1,000 publications on his CV. His work has included book reviews, peer-reviewed academic essays, and award-winning journalism. His work has appeared in many publications, including An Unexpected Journal, Christianity.com, and Myth Lore. And we'll be sharing those links with you today so you can check out some of his work. And today he's going to talk to us about SEO basics for web and print writers. So we'll get to learn you know, what that is and how important it is for us and how to incorporate it in our writing. And we're really looking forward to that today, Connor. So welcome to Writer's Chat. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's yeah, great to be here. I believe... I think the fun part is I think there's at least three people in here who have written stuff for me. So it's there's a nice there's a nice coming home vibe here. Yes. Hello, everybody. So just, I'm going to be sharing, as Melissa said, I'm going to be talking about SEO. I'm going to start by talking for web and then for print. I'm going to be using my insights. I'm also going to be building on insights from experts like Bruce Clay. And some of those are links that I'll probably include. In the chat, if I can, if I can't, once this goes to YouTube, I'll probably post those as comments so you can go back later on and get some, see some of my resources. Awesome. So, yeah. so with that, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to be sharing some slides, if we're all ready for it. Absolutely. Here's, let's see. Houston, do we have liftoff? And here we go. Yeah. Of course, if I went to the front, that would be best, but uh, hold on. All right, and then present is... Where is present? I know I should know how this works. Is that, hold on, from beginning. Okay, yes. So we're talking today about SEO basics for web and print writers. Now, I think a lot of you probably are wondering, first of all, what is SEO? Well, it stands for search engine optimization. A search engine is the program that you're going to use when you go online to search for something. And when you type something into the search bar, it's going to go out onto the World Wide Web. It's going to collect what it thinks are the most relevant articles and then bring them back to you. So the search engine is Google, Bing, Safari. You may know some of the smaller ones like Ecosia and DuckDuckGo. Now, to make sure that you get the results you want, it has an algorithm that's going to try and sort everything it can bring in to try and give you the best ones. That's what makes sure that when I type in how to bake chocolate chip cookies into the search bar, I get 10 cookie recipes and only one video of the cookie monster singing about how much he likes cookies. They're both nice content and I may want to see both of them at some point, but for now I want to bake cookies. So the algorithm ensure, works to ensure that it brings the results. Optimization is about how we make this work for us. It's well, make sure that when I write an online article, I tr want it to have the right keywords in it so that it will. my article will be on the first page of Google, preferably in the first five results if I can, but we'll see. Now, there is inherently a little bit of guesswork in this. You know, Google does not want me to figure out how its algorithm works because if it could, I could cheat. I could put subpar content up and just cheat the system. So it's always changing its algorithm. Bruce Clay estimates that Google changes the algorithm around over 300 times a year. They're not totally throwing it out, putting in a new one, but they are 
changing little bits and pieces to try and make it more sophisticated, harder to crack. But within that, there are basic tools that we do know work. So with that, now we're going to look at how we make that work for us. To start off, we have to ask, what is our keyword? This is the proper noun or verb or maybe the big phrase that defines my work. You can probably figure it out for yourself just by thinking, what do I write about? What is my subject? So I'll give an example from my work. I write a lot of material for Christianity.com. That's a generally American Protestant readership, and they love C.S. Lewis. Anything C.S. Lewis inklings or his friends, that does well. So I can write out and say, okay, my first keyword is C.S. Lewis. Then it's C.S. Lewis books, C.S. Lewis quotes. I can go down C.S. Lewis's friends, what are their names? You can write out a list from there. A great, I can also use a tool like Google AdWords to help me out. Google AdWords means that if I have a subscription to it, I can look up a keyword and see, okay, how many thousand people are searching for this keyword in a given month? Does that number fluctuate? You know, does it get really big at C.S. Lewis's birthday and then go down a few thousand? And then you get the idea. Even if you don't have access to Google AdWords, though, you can figure out it pretty, you can get a pretty solid idea just by, again, going through what is my list of my big topic and the associated things. The key thing, the key part to remember is you don't just, you don't want the very biggest keyword you want something that's in the sweet spot between a really big keyword and a really small keyword. The reason for that is that if a keyword is really, really big, that means there are a lot of people searching for it and lots of people making content. Your job is you're trying to make sure that you write the thing that will become one of the top five search results if you can. So I know that I probably can't get in the top five just for the keyword C.S. Lewis. You know, there are easily thousands of people are writing about him every year. But I might want to look at something smaller. So I might go down and say, okay, well, everyone's written about him. Everyone's written about his friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. Everyone's written about Lord of the Rings. Not many people have written about their friend, Charles Williams. He was another part of their Oxford writing group, the Inklings. He, but he's not nearly as well known. It's that that means that that keyword has a smaller pool. It's much more likely that I can rank for that. But do I need to get more specific again? Have I hit the sweet spot yet? Because Charles Williams is a pretty generic name. Do I mean Charles Williams, the Howard University basketball player who's in his senior year right now? Do I mean Charles Williams, the American writer who wrote paperback novels with titles like Hell Hath No Fury? Or do I mean this Charles Williams, the British writer who wrote various fantasy novels? Well, I mean that third guy. So I need to make my keyword even more specific. Something like Charles Williams Inkling. That's a little more specific, smaller search volume, but I can definitely get into the top few results for that. So there you see the thing of, okay, I want to find my keyword, but I don't just want any keyword. I want something that's specific enough that I can get to the top of this small pond, not necessarily the thing everybody else is searching for. Our next question then is, where are we going to put this keyword? We know the algorithm's looking for it, but where do we put it? We can't just put it everywhere in the article because that looks spammy and the algorithm is smarter than that. It, will, it might even penalize me if, it, if, I, if I'm clearly over trying. So I can't just write Charles Williams six times at the top of my article and get to the top of the search results. That means I have to consider what is specific places to put the keyword. And if I'm writing an online article, I need to ask these six questions. I need to ask what's in a title, what's in a URL, what's in the photo, what's in the header, what's in the link. I know that can feel like a lot, six questions, so I'm going to go through what each of them means a little bit. The title, of course, is what your 
is yeah is pretty self-explanatory. It's that big piece of bolded text at the top of your article. I want to make sure my keyword is in that, but in a natural way. One way that really helps with that is I might try to phrase it as a question. So I could go with, was Charles Williams an inkling? Or how long was Charles Williams in the inklings? Or I could maybe go for something that riffs a little bit on what other people have written. So I know that one of the best resources on Charles Williams is a blog called The Oddest Inkling because Williams was an interesting guy. He had some very strange, unusual ideas about Christian spirituality. So the blog is called The Oddest Inkling. So maybe I can riff on that a little bit without stealing it. In this case, I knew the pers that person, so I got permission to riff on it. So my title was, Why Was Charles Williams the Odd Inkling? I've got my keyword in it. I've got, as a question, and it's an intriguing one. You're left wondering, really? Why was he odd? You, know, you see how it goes. The second question we need to ask is, what's in a URL? That, you probably know, that's the official term for the link that gets generated for your article, whatever shows up on the very top search bar. You want to make sure that you have the keyword in that URL somewhere. You probably want a short URL if you can, just because I assume a few of your readers are going to try to type the URL in themselves, so it needs to be memorable, but you still want the keyword in it. So I want Charles Williams Inkling as part of my link. That's three words, maybe four. You get the idea. The third question is what's in a description? And this, maybe it take a little more explaining. If you were to go into Google right now and type something in, you'd get a bunch of articles, right? You'd see the title for each one. You would also see about two sentences underneath each title, which is telling you what the article's about. That's called a search snippet. And what Google does is it goes into the first paragraph of your article and it takes that, rewrites it a little bit to produce that search snippet. So I want to be sure that I have the keyword or something pretty close to it in my first paragraph, preferably in the first couple of sentences. Now, it used to be that what you would do is you could use HTML code and you could make a meta description. That's in HTML code, you have these little, I'll explain this. You have these little tags, these little words in front of each paragraph. So if you would put, so P to start a paragraph, P with a slash to say end the paragraph. And then you have other little tags that tell you, should this part be bold? Should this part be in italics? The meta tag was one of the ways that you would set a little piece of your text apart. It used to be that if you made a piece of text your meta description, that automatically got better rankings. That's not true anymore. That stopped being true about 2009, which means that strictly speaking, you're not going to be able to use, you're not going to, you can't just put your keyword into your first paragraph and automatically get better views. You can't quite cheat the program that way. But the fact that you have the keyword in that first paragraph means that Google is reading the article, it's getting an idea what it's about, and your readers are getting an idea what it's about. And that or changes how you're ranking. So it's not quite a direct, it's not quite a direct tool like with the title where you absolutely know once I get this in, it's definitely going to push everything up this much. But you still definitely want to be sure that you have your keyword in your first paragraph because it affects other things in the background. The fourth thing we need to ask is what's in a photo? Now, alt text is a program that you use so that when you put an image into your article, you can also add a description of what's in the photo. I can put a photo of Charles Williams as my cover image, and then I can type a description saying, this is Charles Williams in 1935 in a restaurant in London after meeting T.S. Eliot. That's my alt text. I want that because it means visually impaired readers can 
skim through my article and their computer has a program that will read off the alt text, tell them what's in the photo. Google's algorithm is also gonna read that alt text and that's going to affect how it ranks the article. So I really want to be sure my keyword is in that alt text somewhere because it makes Google see the article more, it makes it more prominent, things rank higher. And it also makes the article easier to search, which means visually impaired people are going to find my article easier. So it helps everybody. The fifth question we need to ask is what's in a header? Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about HTML text again. Like I said, in HTML, you've got these little tags that decide what your text is. One of them is called an H2 tag. You've probably already seen this. If you write in Microsoft Word, you know on the top is you have styles you can put the text in, you know, normal, heading one, heading two, no spaces. Heading two is basically an H2 tag. It's that's effectively what it does. And that's when you're making a text super bold to say this is a new section. You know, every time I'm going through my article and going, okay, this section is about Charles Williams' life. This section is about his friends. I'm creating a little piece of bolded text on the top to kind of show this is the new section. And I want each new section to be put in heading two. That gives it an H2 tag. And the algorithm will look for that because when the algorithm looks at these little bits of bolded text, it can tell what's the article about? Is it going logically from point one to point two to point three? That is an indicator that the article is relevant. So I wanna make sure that whatever my little section headers are, I want my keyword in them somewhere. I want headers on when did Charles Williams join the Inklings? That's one header. I may want, was Charles Williams really an Inkling? That could be my next one. You get the idea. So how you define, so how you, how you signal a new section is starting and making sure you get a keyword in there becomes really important. The last question we're going to look at is called what's is what's in a link. And we've got two links we have to worry about. The first one is hyperlinks. Hyperlinks is when you have written your article and you want to include a link to something else. So you go right click, insert link, and you put one in. That's a hyperlink. Now, what I really want is I want to include links that are to really reputable sites. So I want, may find out, is there a Charles Williams Society? Or is there, has some college up there got a resource on him? Those are kind of meaty, substantial links with primary sources that make my article look good. A backlink is a little more complicated. The backlink means that once my article is done, once I've plugged in everything, and my Charles Williams article is out there on the web for you to see, I want other people to use it because the more people you mention my article, the more Google notices and the more higher it ranks. Partly that means that if I write other stuff on related topics, I'm going to include a link to my article in it. If I do an article in two months on the Inklings, then I'm going to look for space to put my Charles Williams link in it. I also want to do networking to try and get my backlinks out there. So I might do a guest blog on someone's website about the Inklings. I might appear on a podcast about the Inklings. Every time I do something like that, I am getting my name out there on someone else's site and I'm getting my links out there. What Melissa did at the start of this presentation is an example of that. We talked a little bit about me and then she talked about links to my work that are now in the chat. You now have my backlink. And, and if you check that out, it helps me, but not in a creepy way. It's, part, it's just marketing. So think to yourself about once you've gotten the article done, what are the ways you're networking and getting your name out there and getting your work out there to slowly but surely give that article more prominence? How are you building a reputation online to 
that will make all of your work rise in visibility. Now that we've gone through how we, where you plug a keyword into an online article, the next big question a lot of you probably want to know is, what does this mean if you're writing a book? I'm guessing most of you aren't thinking about alt text or meta tags when you're typing the book out that you want to go out to your publisher in a few months and then be in your brick and mortar store. Now that's probably true, but you're probably using some of these tools already. For example, we talked about headings. Most of you probably have figured out that there is a shortcut in Microsoft Word where you can insert a table of contents. And that means that every time you change your chapter, it automatically updates. So you don't have to go through each and every chapter and make a tiny change whenever you overhaul anything. That shortcut, basically what that's doing is it's putting each of your chapters as heading two. So you already are using H2 tags, whether you know it or not, which means that you don't know, you're not in the dark as you think. You just may not have the proper words for some of this yet. So that is hopefully comforting as you look into how you use it as a print writer. Your big tools for print writing is you have to consider what your keywords are. And typically they are your author name and your book title. Your author name is, that's your overall brand. That's how people know you, how they search for your work across your various projects. Your book title is your current project. You want to ask yourself, where are those right, right now? So can you see how those fit into your book cover, for example? Do I want, if, for example, if Baker Books hired me to do a short biography on Charles Williams for a Inklings in 30 Seconds biography series, then I probably want to see, okay, I want Charles Williams' name on the cover, obviously, and I want probably the word Inklings on the cover too, because that means that people will recognize the book easily. It means that when someone looks for the book on Amazon, I'll probably be one of the first big results. The official Charles Williams biography, which came out about six years ago now, is called The Third Inkling. So there's the example of, okay, I want the author's name on this, of course, but I also want something that makes it more distinct so that, it's, so that the book sells well and is memorable and does well in an Amazon search and when people look for it. So again, the Charles Williams Inkling example works really well. You also may want to consider, can I have my keywords on my back cover somewhere? You don't need it in the first paragraph, but somewhere to remind readers what it's about. Now that may of course change depending on how your book is published. If you're an indie publisher, then you're doing all this yourself. If you're working with a press, then you have to double check with marketing and see uh, what's their process, how are they doing it? And they'll probably have this figured out already. The bigger thing that you that is more in your control is, are you using keywords in your marketing? You know that by this point that you're not just releasing a book. You are doing book signings. You are going, doing library guest appearances. You are building an author website. You have a social media page for your work. You probably have a special social media page for your book launch so you can give out free goodies to people for free for books so that they can give you good review give you reviews on Amazon stuff like that you want to make sure that whatever your marketing is it uses your keywords so i want to make sure that my personal author website has my name on the top somewhere i want it in the url somewhere and i probably want some to figure out what is my particular angle as an author, what's my subgenre, what's my special focus, and I want that in a little description somewhere on the first page. I also want to make sure that all the little social media stuff I build has my name on it somewhere, and if I build something for this book I'm working on right now, I want the book's name in it pretty prominently. So there you see the process of you're not, you're using the keywords 
maybe not so much in the book itself, but probably on the cover somewhere, at least in the title. And you certainly need to know your keywords so you can do your marketing well, whatever that looks like. Now, now that we've kind of looked at what SEO looks like if you're writing for web or, or you're writing for print, there is one thing we should get into. I know a lot of you are probably thinking right now, well, we're talking about using tools so that an algorithm, a computer can recognize my work. That may feel a little impersonal. It, it means that I'm, you could look at that as I'm writing work so a computer likes my work. That may raise the question, does that mean eventually that a computer can replace me? Why can't an AI write the content instead? Well, that, that is not an unreasonable question to ask. I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about AI replacing writers in the last six months or so. In November 2022, OpenAI released a new bot called ChatPGT. And this can write poems, it can write turn papers, it can answer questions. I have various friends in academia who are already talking about how will they make sure that their students write their papers and that AI don't do it for them. I have other friends in other fields who are worried about, does this mean writers will eventually, does this mean eventually an AI will get our jobs? Well, the answer to that, I would say is that no, but with some caveats. It is possible that we're going to live more in a world where AI writes certain kinds of content. So Jennifer Rotner, who runs the writing and editing company Elite Creative, has a new article in Inc. Magazine where she talks about what she calls human-led AI writing. What she means is that working in jobs where humans write and edit work, but they use AI for some functions. We all may want to think long and hard about how we feel about that and what we'll do if we end up getting a job opportunity where we do that. If we don't want to do that, then we're going to, have to start thinking about how do we find other writing jobs? How do we have our backup plan? That's a worthwhile thing to ask, and it's something we all have to think about individually. But before you start to worry that Skynet is going to steal your CV, there are two encouraging things. The first one is that crafted work always beats generic work. AI may takes may end up getting hot, um, used to do some really generic kinds of writing. When I started out as a paid freelance writer back in 2017, I was writing driver's education guides where I would literally just take uh, the driver's ed handbook for a given state, and then I would build a multiple choice test. That's a pretty basic menial job. That's the kind of thing that pretty much anybody could do. And I suspect in five years, a lot of companies will be hired, will be getting AI systems to write that instead, because it's just that generic. But the crafted stuff is stuff that only humans can do. In that same job, I was also doing things like writing what are the best hiking, hiking trails in the Pacific Northwest. That requires deep research. That requires crafting sentences as well. And that's the kind of stuff that an AI cannot do. In fact, Rotner, who I mentioned earlier, brings this up. She points out that although chat PGT can produce a lot of content, 95% of the time you can tell that it's an AI doing it. The, the writing is clunky. The research is not that good. It just... It reads like a human didn't do this. And she points out that means that a search engine can tell whether it's AI content and it will penalize it because search engines are in the business of producing or showing you good content. They want well-written, crafted human content to be near the top because that satisfies their readers, which helps them sell ads, which makes this whole, keeps the whole system going. So Google is in the business of, of putting human content first. That's the, that, should, that means that we're not, we don't have to be too worried about losing our jobs. The second thing, and this goes back more into SEO, is that you can already tell with SEO that human content beats, gen, beats generic computer content. One of the 
big guidelines I have for my freelance writers is that they can quote other people, but 25% or less of their articles is quotes. Everything else has to be original. The way I look that up is I have Grammarly, and Grammarly has a plagiarism checker. That will tell me not only whether things have clearly been copied and pasted from somewhere else online, they will also tell me things like, are the sentences so generic they sound like something someone else wrote? So Grammarly's plagiarism checker will tell me, once my Charles Williams article is done, whether my first paragraph is so generic, it could be talking about anybody, it could be talking about Ernest Hemingway or Martin Luther or whatever. It will tell me that based on what, and that means that pushes me to write better, to craft my work better, which means that SEO not only shows me if I'm accidentally borrowing someone else's work, it can indirectly push me to do better. When I use these tools properly, what they do is it tells me, yes, here's how you use keywords to get better search results, but it's also pushing me to do my best work because I also know that even if I get the keywords right, I still have to make sure that 75% or more of the article is my work. I also know that Google generally gives the best results to articles that are 1,200 words or bigger. At that length, I have to really know what I'm talking about. I So therefore, the tools are pushing me, when I use them correctly, to craft my work, to make it better, to do things a computer can't do. On a final note then, I just wanna give an inspiring final message. We've talked a lot about technical tools here, and we've talked about what the future of writing is a little bit. One thing I do wanna point out within this is, I wanna reaffirm that when you use AI well, it's a tool. It is something you are doing to, write, to get, make your work more prominent. It is something that when you use it properly can push you to make work better because you know you have to mostly have original work. You know that it has to be long enough that you have to really know what you're talking about. All of those things are how you use it well, so that you're not just using it as a substitute. You're using it to push you to do the best work you can. The other thing is I found consistently as an editor that humans are funny. What I mean by that is that humans will look for things that a computer wouldn't think of. Right now, I have one freelancer working on an article about what does the Bible say about smoking? That's her keyword. That's not the kind of thing most of us would have thought about if we went to Bible college. It's that kind of surprising thing that humans come up with. I've also had times where I've had articles that I didn't think were gonna do that well that surprised me. There was a week where an article on visiting gravestones was doing pretty poorly. It was doing 100, 200 views. And then it jumped up to 6,000 views over a weekend. And I have no idea why. Something may have happened. Someone may have brought up cemeteries online and that created a butterfly causes a hurricane situation, but I don't know. What that means then is that because humans ask surprising questions and look for surprising things, there are things that only humans can write about to supply those needs. When we use SEO properly, we're using it as a tool to further that. It's not computers replacing us. It's not taking the human element out of it. It's a tool we're using to further our search to make good content while knowing that there will be some surprises along the way. On that, I've now finished with, that officially concludes my slides. And if we want to open up for questions, I'd love to hear them. Let's go back through the chat. There were some questions hanging there, I think, and we'll talk about them. We'll ask if anybody else has questions. I'd, Melissa, have you followed any of them? I, haven't, I have to go back and scan some of them. Yeah, I'm scrolling back to find the, the first ones I saw. There were several. Uh huh. Um, but we had quite a few. I had, I had put one in that I've. 
I had put one in that I had forgot to put the question mark on, so it might be a little harder to find. And that was just, um, does uh, do the um, keywords count in other H tags, not just H2? Yeah. That seems to depend on what system you're working with. The advice that I got from, the advice that I've gotten right now from the team I work with is don't use an H3 tag. But I think that was primarily because we used to use what's called Facebook has this function called instant articles and at least it used and at least my understanding is that if you use an h3 tag in an article somehow that glitches with Facebook and it doesn't do well and of course when an article does well on Facebook that's better for everybody but now we're getting into the question of is Facebook a big part of your marketing plan and that will affect whether or not you can use it other people I've looked at online have said you do you do want to use H2s and H3s. And I think WordPress currently tells you only use an H1 once. But an H1 tag is basically your big title. Huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. I always use them based on size and what I thought was good for aesthetics. I need to rearrange my thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not, I mean, you're not totally off, I think. The logic of does the article follow is more important, but that probably means you're doing sequential order and that has an aesthetic to it. So you're probably not too far off. What you shared on the alt uh, tags would, that was interesting to me because I always thought you just put the keyword in and you did more of a sentence, you know, more of a descri more description in the alt tag than what I, that surprised me. Can you give us some feedback on that? Well, partly that's because alt text began as, well, it's usually as described as it's the way that you are helping visually impaired readers know what's going on. I want to make sure that, so my brother-in-law has for as one eye blind, 40% of vision in the other eye. I want to be sure that his, that if he has a computer that is speaking the, mm -hmm and give him a description of the article, I want him to have an idea what's in this photo. So that's what it's initially designed for. I think the key, um, adding the keyword is, you, you, you wanna fit it within that so that it doesn't become too mercenary. That's the best way to put it. Okay. Fre frequently what I end up doing is I'll just put a short sentence like two people on a bench, sunset, mm -hmm. comma, then the keyword. That's kind of the nice happy medium. Thank you. Thank you. That's new for me. Dad, I appreciate that. I've Is got a listen? quick question for Connor. Um, okay. Is it too late or do we get penalized if we go back and change uh, articles that are already live, uh, like on my blog, if I go back and fix the um, all of these SEO issues? Well, I would recommend going back to optimize it if you can. I think I believe... What I frequently do in work is if I have to change an article to help it rank better, there's a website called, I believe it's called Google Search Translate. I'm going to double check. No, Google Search Console. Google Search Console mm -hmm. is a program. I assume you have to get a subscription for it. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. What this does is it means that I can re-index an article. Once my article goes live, it gets indexed auto, probably automatically, and that, and that and that affects the rankings. But if I have to change it, I can then make my changes. I can probably republish it, and then I go into Google Search Console and ask, "Please re-index this article." There may be some other tools that you can use depending on what program you work with and what search engine you work with. That would be one of a question where you just have to do your own research. That reminds me of another question that was in the chat, and that is, do you still need to submit your website in general to a search engine to be crawled? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I'm not, I, I'm part of a team of people. And so because of that, I work in a very specific section of getting the content. So I don't actually build the website itself. There are other people involved who do that. So I honestly don't know what the answer is to that question and what it currently is. I think what I've seen with Google Search Console is that whoever built the, the business account I'm using submitted the websites to it and it had them crawled. And then I build on that. 
Mm -hmm. Google Search Console knows my sites and now it, it's crawled them. So now it's re-indexing. There you'd have to see, I recommend, you have to double check, you have to ask somebody who's done more work with building websites themselves to get the, the, de the detailed answer. Thanks. Yeah. We also had a question about the difference between a hyperlink and backlinks, which we sort of tried to answer, but we're not sure we answered correctly. So we're going to go ahead and ask you, what, is, what exactly is the difference between a hyperlink and a backlink? All right. Well, then I'll, so I'll put it this way. So when I'm writing the article, I'm putting links to other people's work in my article. That's called a hyperlink. Backlink is the special term for when other people cite my work. So I'm going to, so it's where, so to use that example I gave, when I wrote my Charles Williams article, I put links to other articles about the Inklings in it. If I go on to somebody's Inklings blog, I write a guest article, I can put the link to my, I can find a place to put the link to my Charles Williams article somewhere in there. Now, the link to my article is on someone else's site. That's a backlink. It's someone else. It's another website, another writer mentioning my work, getting my name out there. So, so it does sort of just depend on who's using it. So for you, the hyperlink, I mean, it's the same link, but it's this. And then, the, yes. All right. Good yeah. thing. Thank you. Yeah. Backlinks would also be like if you referenced other post on your own blog or website too in a different mm -hmm. um, post, in a new post. So then exactly. bounce back between those two. Right, exactly. You mentioned book titles and I was curious, you know, keyword in your book title, but a lot of books have a tagline too. Does it matter? Is one stronger than the other to be sure your keywords in? Cause that may, May decide how you want to title your book if your tagline isn't as important to put those keywords in. I suspect that probably varies depending on what you're writing. So my suspicion, I would guess that if you're, if if you're working on, if your book is on economics and you're writing about a particular kind of economic subfield, you're going to want that probably under the tagline or the subtitle right. somewhere. You may not necessarily, if I'm writing a fiction book. I don't necessarily want the word fantasy in the title. I might want, I might have a, a tag on at the bottom that says a fantasy novel or. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what other question? Did you find another question, Melissa, at all? Did we miss something else? I'm coming down after the ones we've already addressed here. I've got um, one. Is there a plagiarism yeah. checker that is free? that you know of, a free plagiarism checker. Do you, yeah, do you know of a, a free plagiarism checker apart from the paid version of Grammarly? That's a very good question. I mean, I have, I don't, that's a good one. I haven't, I hear good things about EasyBib. I, you might want to look into I've heard of my head I can't think of five results. I mean Easy Bib has a good reputation. I hear there are several you can you'd have to look yet yeah. I don't have a full answer. I, I can tell you Grammarly is the Grammarly is the best known one. You can look into a business account, a personal account. You can probably do a free trial version so you can see how it works for you. EasyBib is another well-known one. And there probably are, if you type into Google now, you probably come up with a good 10 reputable results that are, that are at least decent. And then you have to just trial and error, see which one works for me, how deep is it going, et cetera. Rachel mentioned one called paperrader.com. I'd say try it out, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Leslie wanted to know about, they said they built a website uh, and could not get it listed in the top 10 on Google or Yahoo. And they were told you had to pay to get it top, to be top 10. She didn't know if that was true. Is that still true? That's a very good question. And I'm not sure the full answer. Let me just... 
that ten years is a pretty long time is a pretty long time in computer development. Like I said, there are things that are changing every mm -hmm. couple of years. So within that, I would probably say I suspect that's not entirely true. I it would probably depend on what your keyword or your subject is. If it's something Again, the more generic it is, the harder it is to get up there. And the biggest, and if it's the biggest ones, frequently are ones that are run by run by large companies or groups where they're paying to get the best domain name and they have yeah. a team of people working. That's what makes sure that if I'm looking up Christian topics, the top ones are probably going to be Christianity Today, the Gospel Coalition, and then Christian, and then hopefully Christianity.com. <laughs> but part of my but part, but part of my work is making sure that my that the site I work for tries to get up towards that top three. So yeah, yeah. And when you go to the front page of Google, uh, you, what we're seeing right now is all video, too, mm -hmm. isn't it? I think it's video up there, and and uh, I that is something we you know there's an SEO that that's high that's popular right now. Yes, that's a good point. That is one of the big changes that video content is becoming much more popular, which does mean that if we're doing, yeah, if you do, if you can do YouTube videos or you do podcasts or I have several colleagues who what they'll do is they will take short articles that have been written and they'll just build videos. I'll take the text, create it, turn it into a graphic and that runs through the video with some music in the background. That's one way you can turn text into video content. Okay. Okay. So Sophia, Sophia has a question. Yeah. Sophia, jump in and ask your question. Okay. Um, I put it in the chat, but if I'm referring to a novel as an example in an article I'm writing on how to write this, in this case, it's science fiction and fantasy. Um, I usually include a picture of the cover when I reference them. Should I say in the alt text, hidden current by Sharon Hink cover, or should I describe the color? I would uh, put, yeah, no, your first example, put sh put book title by this author, and then, may and then maybe add, it's a fan, and then maybe add fantasy novels for whatever. So yes, mm -hmm. get all your proper nouns in there. Okay. Um, the other example is um, another book I'm citing is A Star Curiously Singing by Kerry Neitz. Now he has a free ebook available on his website. So I try to point the people back to that. That's a lot of alt text. <laughs> <laughs> well, how much is the, um, so you're right. I mean, you do want, you want alt text for each photo you use if you can use it. You don't necessarily how much alt text you use is, is going to be a little bit of a tough one. So you're, you're putting a photo of the guide, then I would say, yeah, put the, make sure your alt text has the name of the guide, who wrote it, try to fit in whatever your big search keyword is in it. Hopefully that's one sentence. Okay. If you can make your alt text be one solid sentence with, with good meaty content in it, you're doing good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do we want to invite people to come on back on and ask any other any roundup questions as we wrap up? We got about five minutes here before we wrap up. Sure. So come on back on, get your video. If we if you can't get back on, put it in the chat. It looks like Melissa was active putting some of you into the writer's <laughs> chat jail today, <laughs> which means you can't get back on unless she releases you. So <laughs> the Melissa one. has the power. Uh, <laughs> look out, so so just put it in the chat if you can't come back on video and, and stuff. And it's so good to see faces. I love this. On, on that. A bunch, bunch coming on. Anybody have questions right now while we got a few more minutes left? It's a lot to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yeah. changed so much. I mean, I remember I used to write SEO articles like, what, 10, 15 years ago. And you wrote this key phrase like, five times in a 300 word article, you know? So it was like very repetitive <laughs> writing, obviously. And then now, I mean, that's, it's, it's just so different. It has really, really evolved and, and changed 
so much. And then I was thinking the same thing because that's when I was writing too. Was back yeah. in two thousand nine when metadata was still a thing. <laughs> yeah. And Connor, it depends on the medium a little bit too. If you're writing for WordPress versus writing for a probably a magazine that might be picked up, it, there's probably slight differences between the formats. Definitely, yes. All right. Any other questions? Connor, thank you. Thank you. Melissa, any wrap up? I, yeah, I was just looking at it. It seems like you covered everything. I mean, yeah, it's it's like the proverbial drinking from the fire hose, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're just trying to absorb it all. And yeah, I've, I've got the wheels turning in my own head about ways to, to fix yeah, blogs or to, to, you know, republish things. And so, yeah, this has been great, Connor. Thanks for coming on and sharing with us. And I think we're going to have a lot of people revisiting the replay and, and going over <laughs> I see, it. I see Joe saying that, that I think so that, that, that was, it, it was good. And we appreciate the update and all, all that on that and double play. What is that? Double playback speed. <laughs> <Tina said. laughs> That's really good. On that I, have a a, I have a question. Okay. Melissa, hey. you mentioned blogs and all of a sudden I'm thinking I don't blog a lot but when I do there's something down the bottom of my blog that says RSS feed and something else that I have no idea what they are. So I don't put anything there. Is that what we're talking about today? Yes. Well, yes and no. So RSS, let me see. I actually I know what a RSS. meta description is. I've had to write that. But there's RSS feed in there. There's two boxes, and I can't remember what the other one is now. And I keep saying, you know, I should really look that up. It's probably important. Um, That's a good, yeah. <laughs> good question. You know, I feel like I'm in ninth grade algebra two class staring at my book going, what language is this written in? <laughs> You know, so. So it looks like, and this is based on what RSS.com is telling me, an RSS feed means you're able to update content for, and then it will show you what the updates are. So that is, I think that's more along the lines of if I'm running a, if you were running, say, a blog that you update on a pretty regular basis, so weekly, every couple of days, or something in a, in a field where you're making, yes, constant updates, the RSS feed would be very important. Okay. But I think, yeah, I think that fits into a different subsection of the discussion, but it's definitely worth figuring out what it is just because yeah. if you have questions about something and you're unsure, it's always get good to do your research, to check, to ask, to see, oh, maybe this changes things in a way I didn't expect. Okay. And Tina, yeah, I yeah. take RSS feed. I, I can take, I can go to a website and if I can find the RSS feed, it's usually a link. I can take that and I can put it into my mail program, which is Thunderbird. And I can read the RSS feed right in my Thunderbird program. So it's, it's used as like a feed reader. There are different feed readers that mm -hmm. you can use. Um, so that's kind of what it's for. So if you um, enable that, you can let somebody get that, then they can choose to get your content directly wherever else they prefer to read it. So that's kind of what it is. So like um, on your blog, uh, like WordPress blogs are a good example too, um, but any blog that'll allow you to um, set it up so that people can uh, choose to follow it, then the RSS feed is important and that they get the the posts from your blogs. And that's, that's all included in that. I don't know. I'm kind of mutilating the description there but yeah the so like yep. my feed burner will let you get it through email mm -hmm. yeah well again thank you very much connor this has been wonderful wonderful update and renewal i think we're all thinking a little different i bet we all learned something today melissa next week imposter yeah. syndrome Yes, Sherry Lynn Bisbano is going to join us to talk about imposter syndrome. And in that, she's going to talk Whee! about um, uh, finding uh, support, you know, with other writers so that you can mm -hmm. overcome it. But yeah, it should be a really encouraging uh, episode. We want you to come join us live. And, and if you can't catch the replay for that one, too. Yes, I think it will be great. Great. Anything last minute, Johnny, Brandy, Melissa, anything else last minute? 
If not, then we thank you for joining us today or watching the replay. Uh, we invite those of you that are here live to stay on. We have a little bit of an after party for about five, 10 minutes. And other than that, we look forward to seeing you next week on Writer's Chat. Bye, everybody. Keep writing. <laughs>